Great. Well, um, I think I'll probably kick off. We're just about 11.30. And thank you all very much for, for joining us on this session, uh, Beyond Cider, The Dark Side, Exploring the Dark Side, uh, where me and Martin are going to just introduce some of our co-ferments and cider hybrids that we've been working on um, uh, over the past few years, uh, just to explain a little bit how about how we uh, we came to uh, we came across the ideas and how we make them. Um, I can be fairly technical. If people want to know technical information, do fire out your questions um, as we go along, uh, or I will catch up with it later on as well. Um, but really, I, I'm going to just start by um, giving a very, very brief background of Once Upon a Tree because it, it is all part of the context of, of where we are now. Um, so in 2007, uh, I started Once Upon a Tree um, having walked my dog past the, um, the, the wonderful orchards where we, we, we get our apples. Uh, and as a winemaker, um, I saw the opportunity and the quality of the fruit that was there to make a cider that was uh, wine in a wine style. Um, I'd been living in Jersey and uh, we'd been fortunate enough to go to St. Marlowe where, and enjoy that, that culture of drinking really good ciders and sharing them with friends um, and that, having that whole connection with uh, drinking cider along with food um, and it being a very much a, a sharing experience. Uh, and that was in my mind when we started Once Upon a Tree. So I wanted to make ciders that were uh, that uh that were presented like a wine that would be you'd be proud to take to your friend's house put it on the on the uh, on the table at a, a dinner party uh, and share a bottle so that's the that's where we came from and at the, at the start i was very much a a purist and uh, what was going into our cider was uh true cider apples um a bit of sweet bit of sweet ciders 100% juice, uh, relatively, relatively low intervention uh, cider making. But actually, in, in those initial days, I was, I had a winemaker's controlling grip on it. I realise that now. Uh, and that has changed over the years. Um, so that's where we started. And it went very well from, uh, from what was going to be a little hobby business to start with 7,000 7, litres. Um, it very quickly had legs and, and we expanded um, to uh you know, to a considerable scale we're still relatively small in the overall scheme of things but we're now um producing around about a hundred thousand liters um of cider a year under the once upon a tree brand and then a few hundred thousand liters more for other people um but co-ferments um it took me a well uh, uh, one of, the, one of the things I found that as, as we started selling our ciders is people were asking, why aren't you making them in 500 mil bottles and carbonating them? Because we can sell those. We can't sell 750 mil still ciders. That's ridiculous. So I eventually did have my arm uh, firmly twisted and we went into, we went into 500 mil uh, ciders, um, which, which have done very well for us. And those are the sort of the volume um, ciders that we do. We also do them in kegs. But my heart really uh, remains in presenting in 750 mil and uh, presenting a much more sort of wine style experience. Um, and uh, the evolution of Once Upon a Tree as we grew, um, the uh, say the, the volume went into to 500 mils and the, and the, and the kegs and the uh, baggy box even more so. Um, and there was a, a few years where I felt like uh, I was losing um the connection um the, the whole reason we started once upon a tree uh, and i was keen to claw that back of course uh i was fortunate enough to enough to go to uh america um and and uh cytocon and meet some really fun people who are making um ciders without all that baggage that goes with making cider in, in Herefordshire or in Somerset, where you have a certain culture, a certain history um, of production. And it was enlightening and it, it was it enthused me and got me interested in trying new things. And so that's how it started, co-fermenting uh, and, and, and also the, um, the, uh, the aspect of collaboration 
which we've seen increasing over the past few years. Um, I'm fortunate in that our cidery is also a winery, so we, we are pressing uh, a few hundred tons of grapes every year as well. Um, and so it was relatively easy for me to collaborate with myself and make a co-ferment. So we first started in 2018 with uh, a, a Pinot Noir, a Pinot Dabinet um, co-ferment, uh, which is uh, white um, that was, um That was where we started. And uh, all we did was um, uh, when we pressed the, the grape skins off the uh the wine ferment so the wine's fermenting on the skins uh we pressed the, the, that that wine off um the aromas that were coming from those skins was delicious um and we were also pressing dabinet juice on our uh, on our big apple press and i said right let's not throw those skins away they're not going to the biodigester let's just chuck a load of the dabinet juice on and let's see what happens uh, and, it, and we did it in a in a in a few of those. Um, what every pretty much every cider maker loves are those blue HDPE barrels. We've all got kicking around in the corners. We we stuck a, a load in there um, and, and fermented uh, a few hundred liters. Um, proportion wise, it was a guess. I started. I, I basically I think we 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 did it in sort of twenty kilo batches. So we, we put twenty kilos in one barrel and then topped it up with cider to two hundred liters. Then we did it with 40 kilos up to 200s and, and, and so on until it was mostly grape skin and just a little bit of, of uh, Dabinet juice. Um, in the end, they all came back together. So we, we pretty much had a proportional of 50-50. Of so 50% um, grape skins, 50% Dabinet uh, juice. And um, there was plenty of yeast left in those skins. So the fermentation kicked off pretty quickly. Um, and what how i how i uh dealt with that is 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 um we continue to plunge the skins just like we would do with a with a red wine uh to extract the color and the flavor obviously a lot of it had traveled into the wine and was gone but there was still flavor and color to be had out of those skins uh and we did that for uh you know regularly tasting and, and looking at what we had achieved um we uh um uh, we probably did it for about six weeks um, of, of the of the constant, well, not constant, but, but plunging the, the skins twice a day. Because obviously the skins tend to float, they get full of CO2 whilst the fermentation is going, um, and so uh, uh, are quite open to oxidation. So by plunging and re-wetting, um, and later on when we did it on a larger scale in a big tank, we were draining and returning. So so draining the, um, the ferment from the bottom of the tank and then pumping uh, rapidly over the, over the, uh, the cap, the skin cap. Um, so that it was well wetted and, and incorporated. So we're really trying to extract all those, uh, all that color and flavor, and of course, tannin as well. And this is the, the fascinating, uh, for me anyway, the fascinating thing is this, this interplay of, of full bodied, rich tannins from Dabinet um, uh, alongside the, the tannins uh, of, of, the, of the grape skins. And they're quite different and they, and they take a little while to sort of jump around on your mouth. And one is quite distinct from the other initially. But they do come together um, later on, um, and what I I didn't know at the time because it was just an experiment, and we just sort of threw it together. But I I wanted to try and guide this co-ferment through, so it still was primarily a cider, with a hint of of, of sort of wine-like qualities and uh, and. A um, and so that's what we what we did, and I think we achieved. And I think um, uh, uh, people, once they've tasted it, really enjoy it. Um, bringing it to market, or we'll touch on that perhaps later, Martin. We have a bit of a discussion on that because I think it has its own challenges um, in uh, in how it's identified. Um, it's quite you know I, I struggle sometimes to tell people what it is without a very long conversation. So um, to to expect. Uh, uh, people in bottle shops and so on to, to be able to convey that to their customers can be quite a challenge. Um, but I, I see these products for Once Upon a Tree as getting wine drinkers into the cider category. That's kind of where I'm aiming it. I'm having a lot of fun along the way and they're great drinks and, and that's that's all part of it. But also trying to reach into those 
uh, to those people that, that, are, that are maybe a bit blinkered to cider um, and to see uh, and change their their perceptions of, of what what cider is and what what it can be. Um, from that first Pinot, as I say we did a we we followed that on with a much much bigger batch in in tank in 2019, and we've got another bottling to do very shortly. So it will be back on sale because it's currently uh, sold out. Um, but the following year, we were pressing um, some English. Uh, all of these grapes are grown in England, or, or, or uh, either our own vineyards or some of our contract customers. Um, we had English Cabernet Cortis and uh, some Cabernet Sauvignon, which is grown in a polytunnel um, on our site. Uh, and again, we'd made the wine, um, but I wanted to to do a similar thing. So, so the, the cider that if you've got the if you've got the tasting case, this is the one that's um, that's in your cider. I'm about to open now. We'll just have a little taste through. So if you want to join in it, wherever you are, then um, please open your bottle now. Um, so with the Cabernet skins, you get those real typical um, Cabernet characters and flavors, those eucalyptus notes, um, mintiness, uh, 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 blackcurrant, and so on. Um, and again, I wanted to, to, to get those conveyed into the cider. So this is Dabonet. We, we did exactly the same as the Pinot. We put Dabonet um, uh, juice on the skins. We fermented it. We, we did the whole plunging uh, and, and wetting of the skins to try to uh, to get that color and the flavor out. And it is this sort of, uh, I don't know, copper, I suppose you'd call it. it it's, a, it's, a, it's a real... Um, I, I think I think it's a really attractive sort of browny copper color. Now the darkness comes a lot from the from the dabinet, which is naturally deep in color, deep and rich. Um, and then you've got that sort of warm, uh, glowing hue, which comes from from the grape skins. This didn't evolve exactly as I expected it. Um, I wanted to make this into a traditional method cider to differentiate it from uh, the the dabinet and pinot, which was actually carbonated. Um, and I wanted just to be a little bit more, uh, uh, make this more of a natural process, I, I suppose. Um, so um, it was what's well, fermented with uh, on with, with the yeast that was in the skins, which was um, uh, a wine yeast, um, and then uh, plunged, filtered, coarse filtration, and bottled into into the uh, seven fifty champagne bottle. And Simon, uh, there, there has been a question on the Q&A just about yeah. what, what, what temperature did you ferment it at? There's an idea that a lower temperature um, would bring more fruitiness and a higher temperature might be more flavor and aroma. Well, um, uh, actually, very little temperature control on this. So it's, it was ambient temperature. I couldn't actually give you, we weren't controlling the temperature on these ferments. The reds, um, certainly on our Pinots, uh, do get fairly warm. Um, I'm very confident with our ripeness levels that we're allowed to let, to get them warm to get, especially on the Pinot, you want full color extractions. The Cabernets uh, were smaller batches and probably didn't hit those temperatures. But we're probably talking about 20 degrees uh, when the cider juice hit them. Uh, and the ferments uh, wouldn't have, that would, yeah, they wouldn't, it wouldn't have hit that sort of temperature. Probably at about 15, 16 degrees. Um, cider, Certainly our cider uh, apples are, are, are pretty low in nitrogen. I don't generally add any nutrition to um, our juices. So, uh, yeah, the fermenta fermentations tend to be very slow and very cool. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I think you're probably right. And it does help in retaining uh, some of the more fruity uh, aromas and, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, this this is uh, fermented in a bottle. It was on lees for, uh, oh, goodness me, uh, about about 18 months. Might have been just short of 18 months overall. Uh, and I deemed that as being enough leaves time. I wasn't looking for lots and lots of aut autolytic sort of character in the, in the finish uh, cider. Um, and, and again, just letting the, the fruit come to the fore and, and do the talking. Um, so, but the, but the aromas on here are, uh, are really interesting because you've got these these um, I'd say eucalyptus and, and uh, minty notes are coming through quite quite well, but also quite herbal notes from that extended skin contact. So I think our Cabernet Sauvignon was probably less ripe than our Pinot Noir uh, was when we did the Pinot Dabonet, and so you you do start to get some of those greener 
uh, characteristics coming through, but I, but actually it's something I quite like in in is that sort of more herbal note, sort of notes of um, almost sort of like coriander seed coming through uh, on it as well. And really rich on the palate. Um, as a as a dosage to this, so um, it is back sweetened um, when it's disgorged. Uh, just again to really help lift the that element of grape back, um, but you've really got that cider there. Uh, that davenet really is broad on the on the tongue. Um, and, and I know I see a note there, nine percent. It's uh, it is quite strong, um, and that of course uh, we are getting some of that alcohol from the grape. So this is very is very much a, still a co-ferment. So although the the wine has gone through. Um, uh, you know, through its ferment and, and its finish, when we press it off, uh, there's still uh, an element of wine and alcohol left in those skins, which comes through into that uh, into the cider. So it's quite strong, and also another one and a half percent thereabouts is added uh, when we do uh, the secondary ferment, when that sugar is converted, or you know, the, the yeast convert the sugar to CA2 and alcohol. So you do end up with. You know, quite a punchy uh, uh, co-ferment, but um, you know, I think that warmth and that richness really brings, uh, you know, something to the palate. So I'm unapologetic for that. <laughs> um, very much a sharing cider. Um, we've we've done other trials and other products. Um, we we do make a a, a blueberry wine, uh, a range of blueberry wines for a contract customer. Um, and we did a blueberry co cider co-ferment with them uh, last year, Long Brothers, um, and that was really good fun. Uh, the blueberry was really vibrant and uh, and, and very uh, it, it was very straightforward. Actually, we used it, we used Katie, so quite a relatively neutral cider base for that, and it really big, provided a perfect platform for for the blueberry to to sing uh on there and again it's just a very pale sort of rosé color with that uh our most successful co-ferment has been our blackberry co-ferment which we um uh do in a 500 mil format and also in keg uh and that has been actually very very successful it's probably probably is in fact i think i'm pretty sure it is now our best selling uh cider uh, for for once upon a tree um, and we've also collaborated with the guys at, um, at Crafty Nectar uh, to do the number nine, which is also a blackberry cider, but with um, with hibiscus flowers um, also. And, and that just gives that extra sort of herbal floral element to, to that drink. But when you, uh, I don't know about you, Martin, but I think when, when you do co-fermentation with, with these different fruits, what you what you're not getting is the typical straightforward fruit hit that you might see in a fruit cider, where where they're adding essences or juice back to a cider. It's actually quite a different beast, uh, just like a you know a grape wine. A wine doesn't taste of the grapes. It doesn't actually taste like grapes. It tastes sure. of something really different, and you get that uh, incorporating and and, uh, and and blending in so well with with the cider. So it makes it makes a really interesting and, and, and cool alternative, I think. Definitely, definitely. So um, I, I think uh, you know, to kick things off, that, that's me, but I'd, I'd welcome uh, lots of lots of questions if you've got them on, on anything technical, particularly uh, or, or whatever. But I'll, I'll hand over to you, Martin, if you want to have a talk, talk us through some of uh, your co-ferment stuff. Let sure. I've got some I've got some pictures here I can I can show of my, my, my little story, see if I can um, share the share the screen here um just bear with me a little bit here while we get this um up and running okay so can you can you see that uh simon is that yeah, working yeah, on your end good. Yeah. All good. Good. Cool. cool um yeah so i guess my story is, is uh, quite similar to um was a similar sort of origins to to yours simon in that um I've been um, making Pilton cider since 2010, um, and concentrating very much on the on the keeving process, which is a subject of another talk, of course. Uh, but 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 making a, um, a quite conventional um, cider, mainly in 750 bottles, 
So back in 2010, that was a bit of a, a bit of an uphill struggle, if you like, because um, there wasn't there, there weren't many of us doing it then at that time. Um, so very much like you, um, I was lucky enough to get a trip to the to the states. Um, and there you go. Picture tells the story. There's the there's the kind of stiff English guy on the on on one side in the shirt, and the and the crazy American guys um, without inhibitions and and maybe a bit more open minded as to, as to what what's what's possible um, in in fermentation. Um, I think the other angle as well uh, to bear in mind in the in the US is that um, certainly a lot of the people who are who are getting into who are making cider there now are, are coming from a different sort of fruit background. Um, so these are these are peaches and blueberries who are um, uh, grown uh, by the Wink family um, in Pennsylvania, um, and um, they've been there for um, many generations since um, Old Father Wink first. Um, uh, staked his claim there in, in what is now called Wanksville. Um, but they're growing apples and peaches and sour cherries and blueberries, most of which traditionally would have been going into um, contract um, cold store um, in, in that area um, or for culinary use. Um, so they're not, not getting much value from that. So they're, they're looking at ways of, of, of how they can add value to, to their existing fruit. Um, business, so it's just as natural to try and ferment peaches or blueberries or or whatever fruit you have as it as it would be um, cider apples or um, any apples because they because they don't have many cider apples there. So we're, whereas we're coming at it from a different angle here in 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 that cider makers tend to be just making cider, um, just using apples. So it's it's a different approach. Um, maybe has is part of the reason why we um, have a different uh, product. Um, so the main um, inspiration for me was this this scene, this photo here. This is a chap called Troy at uh, Big Hill Cider, and again they're they're just up the road from from Wanksville, um, and they are growing apples and lots of different fruit, and they're also growing cherries, sour cherries um, for cherry pie. Um, so what he's done here before this. Uh, photo was taken was he's cut the top off um, this IBC and taken it out into the orchard and when you harvest cherries they're, they're harvested by um, uh, shaking the tree uh, and the cherries fall onto uh, like a big umbrella which which collects the fruit and then to a conveyor belt and they just redirected the conveyor belt to fill the IBC in the orchard uh, bring it back into the into the cidery, and just like we would in in Somerset, stick the lid back on again with some with some uh, duct tape, um, and let the fruit ferment. So when I came to visit him, I, I took the lid off the IBC and had a little sniff, and of course it it smells smells horrendous, sort of um, nail varnish. So he said, no, "No, no, don't don't worry about that." So he has this um, battery drill here with a stainless steel rod, and on the end of the stainless steel rod is a is a, like a little propeller blade, so you can uh, whiz up the cherries, and like, like you were saying, Simon, um, uh, they, they, they call it knocking down, don't they, or, or um, mixing mixing the fruit. So this is just 100% fruit um, being fermenting um, on the flesh, if you like, um, but being mixed on a, on a, and blended on a, on a daily basis to to try and um, keep the fruit wet on the top. Um, but also to to spread that that spontaneous fermentation up through the whole vessel, so it's all fermenting. So in the other IBCs, he has a cider made from apples. Um, just out of the shot on the left, he has that that cider then aging in uh, barrels, um, and well, what, with what they're calling uh, sour cider. So he's then blending the sour cider with uh, the cherries and selling it in kegs in the craft beer bars in Philadelphia at, at the sort of top price that you would that you would expect to get for uh, a fruit fruit craft beer but um, and this is a smaller scale this is um, Troy again with um, what we call blackberries or a, a type of blackberries bramble berries again just being in a in blue oak. Uh, being being knocked down with a special uh, uh, well, custom-made piece of stainless to 
to achieve the same thing. But in, in this case, they're doing 100% fruit um, without any any other liquid. So when I came back to the UK, uh, couldn't find any sour cherries. Uh, but remember that my mate uh, did a romantic thing many years ago and planted some um, an orchard in his garden, which um, uh, of course it became somewhat overgrown. So we in, in amongst that we found some plums. Um, so this is um, some of the plums that we found from from there. So this is uh, 2018 summer harvest. Um, so taking those plums, and this is a bit of a um, bit of a plum mashing, which might or might not play. Uh, but but again, the idea is just 100% plums um, in a in a barrel being being in the steel bar to um, to mix them up. So they they start off as whole plums, but they quite quickly get broken. The fermentation starts, and they they are protected by that CO2. Uh, from the from the fermentation, um, well, and we were then um, in, the, in that first um, attempt didn't have a great method for extracting off the flesh, but uh, we we sort of strained it through some some material that we had um, because we 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 don't have an up for, um, for making cider. We get our, our juice contract press, so we didn't have that that equipment. So we then at this stage have a very intense liquid. Um, and and our approach has been to then use that that liquid for for blending for blending with with cider um, or other things that that we may have. And this idea of blending uh, again, I was inspired by um, this. This is wild beer, so they have six hundred barrels in their in their barrel library with different fruits and and mainly beers, but different fruits in in different different styles of different styles of barrel. So. Um, been checking to them, going tasting their barrels, and um, learning from that that style of approach. So for our our plum, this is this is James, um, the, the barrel guy there, who lent us um, a couple of uh, Lefroy barrels, which um, had had beer in them as well. So we uh, put put the plums um, in, in in the barrel. This is our little promotional poster for a, for the launch of Smoky Plum. So. Smoky whiskey um, with with the plums um, together, um, and in in that first in, in in that first product because we had that's what we had always been doing was was the was the key cider in this style of bottle, so this was the sort of technology that that we that we were comfortable with. So the first products were sterile filtered um, and um, carbonated. Um, in a, in in a bottle, so that works quite well for cider, but but um, you don't really want to let plums anywhere near your filter because they don't really like, or well, the, the the filter doesn't appreciate it. So that was a little bit um, challenging uh, as 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 a method. So in the in the subsequent attempt, we then gone for seven fifties, um, and and gone for a slightly more uh, plummy experience. So if you just go back to that first one, it looks a bit more like a cider, but it did did have a good plum taste but again wasn't maybe quite as much as you would expect from something called smoky plum so this is in in 750s but again made with that same approach of making a very intense plum wine and then blending it um with with ciders um some of which had been in in the smoky barrels so same sort of thing with cherries um, so the, these are dessert cherries, really, rather than sour cherries. Very difficult to get sour cherries in the UK, but again, in uh, in in blue oak, um, this uh, little little video. And uh, so again, no liquid at, at this stage, but you quite quickly it, they they break down. You you get a liquid just from from the cherries. You can see it actively fermenting there, so it's it's well covered by by CO two. Um, there was some um, concern of aware as to whether you should take the stems off, uh, but we didn't. We didn't bother, and it didn't seem to have um, an ill, Ill effect there. Um, so this stage, we've upgraded here to a little press um, off eBay, but um, put, in, put in the cherries. So that I think the the thing is to 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 press it relatively soon before it's finished. So it's still got enough CO2 involved. So it's not too oxidized by the, by the pressing process. But again, at this stage, we're just hundred percent fruit. 
um, we, be, before we would mature it a little bit before before blending. Uh, these are black currants. Uh, the nice thing with black currants is they are um, freely grown in 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 Somerset for Ribena, so pressed by thatchers. So it's it's possible to get um, black currants relatively easily. And because they're nice and small and squishy, you can just pass them through a pump. So uh, with a with a mash pump that can handle solids, um, we will just we'll just um, pump them round and round. So we put the um, black currants in in an, in an IBC. First of all, with the top cut off, but then for fermentation, you just pour them in with a pump. Uh, but you get this sort of relatively solid mass on the top that floats uh, with the CO2 and uh, exploded all over the place. So this is this is a messy business. Um, this. Uh, uh, fruit stuff if you get involved so this is, to the best uh, so this is this is uh, yeah black currants again in the in the little press so we'd we'd upgraded the press and and um replaced the wood with some nice nice new um oak slats on it this is uh, the, the first first uh, time of of using it uh, but you can see it doesn't stay doesn't stay nice very long and uh, when you're pressing black currants of course there's, there's quite a few of them who are which are still whole and when you get to a certain pressure, they then explode and you get little squirts of, of blackcurrant, which um, are still evident in the building on uh, various various things. So again, this is this is making uh, a, an intense blackcurrant wine, um, which we then um, aged in in um, whiskey barrels um, to to use for with blending with with other ciders. So just final final fruit in my little little slideshow. This is the latest latest thing so like all, all these good ideas they're all they're all stolen from from uh, other people and other places um and this idea is stolen from um uh, probably from marco there i just saw it was online from northern italy there's a um a, a drink called canotto which is made from a very small bitter orange which are um roasted um in an oven with spices so of course we can't get canotto oranges over here in Somerset, but this is the next best thing. This is um, Seville oranges, uh, which are brought in for uh, the January marmalade season. So this is 300 kilos of, or this is part of 300 kilos of marmalade oranges, just cut in half and then roasted in a in a um, in a bread oven to try and get a little bit of that sort of caramelization uh, with handfuls of bay leaves and um, juniper berries and um, some spices, which apparently is a thing with canotto. And with canotto, this, the, the, the roasted fruit is then soaked on syrup to make a soft drink, which is like a pre which was a precursor to Coca-Cola. So it's been sort of taken over by Coca-Cola a bit, but you can still get it in, in, in Northern Italy as a, as a product. Um, so again, after the oranges had fermented a bit in 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 our blue oak on, on the right hand side with mashing down with the, with the barn the same same method then we're, we're pressing them through the through the press and making a nice pretty pattern with a sort of a few charred pieces or whatever in there as well so it has got a bit of a bit of a, a sort of a, um, a a burnt element to the to the character but this this one is still sort of in in production just been just been bottled uh, recently so um we can then talk to a little bit about about the sort of sales of this and, and i think what's been interesting that i've noticing is, is that there's a cool thing happening in scandinavia so these are young cool guys younger and cooler than us simon yeah um, absolutely um, <laughs> so this is um able of um in in denmark um and what a few producers out there have done is that they've quite cleverly reinvented um fruit cider as fruit pet nat so which of course sounds much much cooler and more interesting um but it is effect effectively an apple based um uh, drink product but it's it's sold on the on the fruit element um up up front rather than calling it cider so this is their products selling in bristol um, and you can see all the latest cool stuff in the background there the belgian beer and down the bottom left-hand corner is some of our um, fruit products. Um, so our, our products are selling at 16, 17, 18 pounds a bottle, which sounds expensive until you know that the Denmark stuff is at 25. 
Mm-hmm. So it's it's great for us in the market because um, yeah. yeah, you know, makes us makes us look good. Um, there's a similar sort of thing in in beer. So this is from from Yonder. So I, I love the specification on this bottle. So 360 bottles made um, with little tiny batches of of forage fruit. So if you can't get big volumes, you can still go down this approach of making this um, fantastic um, collection of of different things, all obviously all thrown into one one container and and all fermented fermented together. So this is our, our range of of um, fruit fruit products, if you like, which um, work quite well together with the with with the cider. So I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen and see if we can come, back, come back out of this. That was really good. Thank you, Martin. Um, I, I was going to open the bottle of your. Uh... Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I got organised with my photos, but I but I didn't get organised with my with my drinking. So I'll... I did it the opposite way around. I'm organised with <laughs> drinking, but not photos. So uh, there we go. Together we we'll make a good pair. Um, so tell us about this. Um, so yeah, so I, I kind of left out the quince part in in the story. That was maybe my first inspiration in in in, in the states, where I discovered a a 100 quince product um, in a, in a trendy bar, um, and um, I was lucky enough to come back and find quince growing in sufficient volume in in Somerset uh, to be able to do that. Um, it actually ended up um, being being more the case that that uh, the best product there was a co-ferment uh, with with Kiev cider and 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 quince but yeah i think quince is a great first step because it's not too different from apples and pears um uh, although it does behave a little bit differently in in the in how you juice it but um hard to mill hard to mill yeah but uh, yeah. some some apples in there as well kind of help yeah, yeah um but but it but and it's sufficiently weird um to 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 be cool perhaps rather than say being strawberries with cider um it would be more challenging to 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 market perhaps than than uh, than, than quince because it's not quite so not quite so well known um, it's delicious it's got such a wonderful uh it's that it's like well that quince um uh, the quince paste that, that that lovely floral aroma that you get with quince but then it's definitely a cider isn't it it's, yes um, it really has those. Um, it's a key base cider. Yes, right? yes, yeah, indeed, indeed. Mm-mm. Really good, really good. Um, we've had a couple of questions uh, in the Q and A, um, so uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, do it in the order they popped in. Uh, Blair, hi Blair. Um, you asked how long do your wine cider co ferments usually last? Uh, two pun- punch downs a day and pump overs. It seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Um, we, you know, we're, we're scaling up. It, it's okay. Uh, we're used to doing pump overs and, and, and so on with the wines. So we just, it's just part of the routine uh, of, of doing it. Usually first thing in the morning uh, before anything else ha- happens in the winery or the cidery. And it's very um, therapeutic. You get a fantastic aroma, and it's uh, it's the best part of the day, really. Yeah, it's good. It really wakes wakes you up, doesn't it? Um, uh, the the photo you saw of of the that stainless steel plunging device is exactly the sort of thing that we use, and and not only in our little blue blue oak, um, but also in our uh, what are they four uh, three or four thousand liter uh, open top red fermenters. Um, it does a good job. Once you crack a corner of that uh, of the cap, uh, you manage to get a get a start, and then everything sort of crumbles in afterwards. So it's a really useful device especially in the early stages um of the of the ferment when the, the cap's actually really firm uh you know it's, it's a good couple of feet deep um and uh it takes a lot of work um uh, but you do in fact I, I said two days a week actually it does tail off because what happens is the ferment slows and the ferment stops uh the skins then sink to the bottom um and with some of these products uh, we then just do sort of an extended maceration and we'll just give them a little little pump over or a little stir every couple of days. So that, that initial plunging is is the hard work, is, is the first few days of, um, of ferment that you have to really get on top of it. Um, Dave Sanders asked, uh, all of these are classed as made wine. How does it affect the production cost and selling price? Mm. Do you want to take that one on, Martin? <laughs> yes, of course. Um, well, uh, uh, 
I guess you have to just um, re re reset your your aspirations. Really, um, cider has has a ridiculously low tax level. Um, if the selling price is is high enough, um, it's it's only an issue really if you're if you're trying to sell it at a, at a low price that the that that the duty is a is a problem. Um, I guess it becomes more of a problem once you're in made wine. Um, there's then a sliding scale based upon the alcohol level, so it um, it kind of works well for us in in that we're blending with Kieved cider, which is low ABV anyway. So that kind of helps. Um, so if you're going for a full dry bottle condition like your nine percent, then then your 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 duty is much higher than that. But if you're selling it in the wine market or in the natural wine market, as those fruit pet nats are selling in, then um, it isn't really that 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 then isn't a problem. But if you're trying to sell it as cider, as as a fruit flavored cider, then yeah, then that's much more then that, that's much more of an issue. So it's yeah, it's, it's but that's a marketing challenge really rather than a, um, a production one. It is, yeah. Um, I, I, so our, <clears throat> the Cabernet Cafement is is full sparkling wine duty. So that's that is, we sell that at about 15, 15 pounds a bottle, I think, uh, retail. Um, you know, because obviously VAT is on top of that as well, uh, on top of the duty. So um, you know, there's quite a chunk of money spent uh, going to the government on that. Um, conversely, our Blackberry, which is in the 500 mil uh, or in keg. Um, and uh, is intended to have a little bit more mass market appeal. Uh, we do have to uh, to break that down to four percent um, to make that work. And it's it's that it's that four. You'll, you'll notice fruit ciders tend to be four percent on the label because that's where the the duty break is. Um, one thing I would say though is going into if you're not already if you're if you're a small cider maker uh, making cider under the seven thousand liter but are, are reaching that limit. Um, this is a opportunity to increase your production, increase your sales, um, keeping the the cider, your 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 um, you know your, your below the threshold cider operation separate, um, registering as a made wine producer and paying duty only on the co-ferments or the made wines that you make beyond there. So it's quite an interesting way to think. Um, you know, when you when you reach that ceiling, it's probably a good way. To uh, to increase your growth or continue growing as a small cider producer, without impacting on or without losing that benefit of, of not having to pay duty on those seven thousand liters, um, and I wish I'd thought of that earlier when uh, when we went through the barrier. Um, uh, so, Lucy, thank you for your question uh, to both of us. Which of the mad inventions are you most uh, are your favourites, and which are the most popular ones? What are the major differences? Uh, so the my favourite mad invention is always the next one, because um, uh, it's always kind of like uh, where where can you go next? How can you how can you move it on? Um, uh, but I, I guess um, the customers like like the last one that you did, and and maybe like the Quince is probably the most most popular because it's um, yeah it's a great it's it's a great product. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting to 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 see where it goes next. Absolutely. And yours. Well, um, uh, I, I don't know if I've got a favourite. I, I, I just everything we do is new and it's been exciting and, and you know it's cool. Um, the the most popular, I think I've said, the Blackberry was is definitely the most popular. It's the one that we've aimed at, at the lower price point, and that's probably why. Um, beyond that, it's it's definitely the Dabinet and Pinot, but that's probably because it came first. Um, uh, in terms of feedback probably our backers i haven't mentioned the backers side of that we made yeah. um so that was um uh, uh using the yeast lees of a wine ferment a backers wine so not actually the skins um i've got one going on at the moment which is using fresh skins pinot noir skins so again quite a different flavor so um when we our pinot noir goes into our red wine but it also we use it for our, our white champagnes because because it's you know, it's a red flesh uh sorry red skin uh, white flesh, like most grapes, um, uh, have a white flesh, uh, and so you press it and ferment it to get the colour. Um, when we press for our champagne or our, our sparkling wine, uh, we, we press them very gently um, and leave lots of colour and lots of flavour behind in those skins. So again, it just starts, starts thinking, well, actually, we could perhaps pick this up in the cider. That's a very different beast um, to the current release, and um, I'm not sure whether that'll that'll 
see the light of day yet. And I've got a couple of others that haven't. Um, you mentioned strawberries. Um, we're, we're part of, uh, of a bigger operation called Haygrove, who are one of the biggest organic um, berry growers in the UK. Uh, and they have, um, they have waste fruit, fruit that either they can't sell uh, for whatever reason, they've got to pick it, but the supermarkets are having, you know, it's going downhill for whatever reason, um, or stuff which doesn't look quite right for the supermarket. So um, we have experimented, that's where the blackberries are coming from, um, but we have experimented with strawberries, um, but um, oh, uh, that, that, was, that had to be wheeled out in a big container and, and never looked at again because it ended up tasting or smelling of sort of, well, there's no way, no polite way of saying this, but, but vomit. Um, it was it was revolting. Um, so that was my that was one of my experiments that didn't work. Uh, that was fermenting on whole fruit. Everything else that we've done, we pressed. And I wasn't sure if it was because we, we, we there was some, you know, maybe a, a bit of I don't know, um, botrytis or, or some other mold growth that had that had caused that problem. Um, uh, but the thing is, you just keep trying um, and and doing new things, don't you? Sorry, I, I, let's go on to the next question. Uh, Rachel Hendry uh, asks, how important could the role of co-fermenting be in the reduction of agriculture and food waste? I think that's very relevant. Martin, what do you think? Well, I, I, I guess one positive side of that, as you, as you say, we, we, we as makers have good, you can, you can often have good access to good fruit um, at, at low cost by taking advantage of that of that food waste we're, we're probably not using enough volume of it to make any dent um at, at all in that in that problem um but so it so yeah it can be good for us we, so we get our grape skins from a from 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 a wine winery for free because they're a waste waste product so that 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 works works well that way but Absolutely, and, and I, I think I just mentioned that the the um, the, the, uh, the blackberries that we use for the blackberry cake ferment are blackberries that wouldn't hit the market otherwise. And um, before they have, some have been sort of uh, diverted, I guess, is into sort of jam production, and they go off to big freezers and hope that somebody might buy them. But quite a lot end up going to um, to the biodigesters nearby, which is kind of a good source. But they actually don't like too much of this sort of fruit because it's too too wet for them. Um, and upsets the the balance of the of the bacteria that are that are working in the biodigesters. So um, it is it is a you know it's a tiny tiny little bit of what we're doing is to recycle, or reuse, or have a second use for those um, those products. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah, it is. I think it is. Uh, I think it's a good point, and it's something that that we are uh, as once upon a tree we are going to be exploring more. With other waste fruit so cherries is, is one for this year um, okay. Martin, which is really interesting so um and also um i noticed you, you you were fermenting on the on cherry stalks i've been having a discussion about um uh, fermenting on stalk with somebody else recently but um uh you didn't find any anything nasty coming from that um i i didn't but i was doing it at the same time as as wild beer were making some cherry product and they had teams of people picking the cherry, picking the stalks off which which worried me a bit at the moment at that time but um but yeah i suppose ours is a slightly um edgy earthy uh final final product so um, we haven't tried it with stalks and without stalks so which would be the only way of of, of knowing the difference i guess and yeah. i suppose the other thing to say but back on that food waste um, and the volume thing is is that all these ciders for us are super small volume, um, and that's that's part of the interest is is that the fact that they're that they're small small runs of products, so they're in demand. People are interested in trying them, but but I wouldn't be suggesting it's a big volume um, market out there um, at the moment yet, anyway, or, or or probably ever would be. It's it's, it's always going to be a specialist niche um, experimental um, thing a bit bit. Uh, I, I kind of agree because the, the ones that I'm, you know, the ones that I'm presenting and we're talking about and drinking now are exactly that. But um, uh, the, my experiences with the blackberry is that it could be, it could be a bigger thing, um, and I think it's a, it's a more, uh, a more honest fruit cider. Um, I'm going to call it a fruit cider because that's what it is. Um, uh, or, or be it co-fermented, it's a bit more of a grown-up fruit cider, mm. um, but it's appealing to that market. But we are, you know, we're seeing relatively good volumes. We're not huge; we're still very small. But I can see that there is um, there is interest in that, um, mm. and that's you know that's quite a 
quite a discussion point because is it taking away from from our uh, our regular side of sales and so on and that's that's something we'll be we'll be pondering and dealing with um as as we progress but i think that's interesting what you said a minute and it's it, uh, somebody else has asked a question about how you convince the wine market um uh, to take on these products but uh, um it's interesting how one develops a language like everything else inside a do, do you call it flavored side not much better um, but it's 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 having a language that the, that the customers will understand what it is, which fruit cider kind of works for that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's interesting to 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 develop that. Um, yeah, grown up fruit cider. I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Uh, and Sam also asked, has anyone done a hop cider? I haven't. Have you done anything with hops, Martin? Um, I did try. Yes, uh, dry hopped black currant, um, which 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 was which was good, but um, as um, I, th I think the, the issue with, with hops is is to uh, is, is to retain that hoppy aroma um, oh. as, as they tend to fade. So in a, in a um, yeah, um, but yeah, that was that was that was definitely interesting, and and that was working with a fruity hop, Mandarina Bavaria, which the craft beer guys are, are using to enhance the fruity flavour. So I thought that was kind of fun with with black currants. Fantastic, um, and 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 I I've never done anything with hops because um, I don't know I feel I have got less connection with with hops and, and and with the beer world. Obviously, they're grown all around us here in Herefordshire, um, uh, but I've, I've kind of left that one alone. I like to feel that there is a connection with the fruit that we use. Obviously, that's why I'm using grapes primarily, um, but also the blackberries that are that are produced on the farm and no other fruit that we're going to be be, be, be using. Um, but that's not to say that I do enjoy a hop cider and Tom Oliver's. Hop cider uh, yeah. I've had on on a number of occasions, and um, I think that works really well. So it can uh, it can produce. Um, but it, uh, but it is such a massive world, the world of hops. So to it's yeah. it, it's hard yeah. enough understanding cider. But when you you open the open the hop catalog and you just it just blows you away with um, so many different options. Exactly. Yeah, and the same with grapes. You know, there's there's a world of different grape varieties out there, all producing different styles and whether you use leaves whether you use fresh skins you use fermented mm. skins um whether you you know you then also then complement it with oak or uh or malolactic fermentations there's so many 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 possibilities and that's really exciting um and a bit mind-blowing i guess but um we i feel that we're just really well i am just beginning on this journey and we only we only get a chance to do this once a year mm. when harvest mm. comes around so um that's the frustration with it too um, I've just seen a, a question from Christian. Uh, how do you how do I take a, a, a product down to four percent? And um, it's water. It's just dilution. Um, so uh, the the blackberry uh, co-ferment. Um, and I'm trying to remember exactly what our base alcohol is. I think it's around five point nine. Uh, might just touch six. So by the time uh, we've had to dilute that back down to four percent, we've got. Um, uh, what is that about 70 odd percent 75 percent uh juice content by that stage um which we then the, the the blackberry is quite a sweet product um again because it's for mass appeal because i'm trying to break into uh, an existing very very sweet fruit cider market uh, flavored cider market so um but that helps then to bring back that fruit flavor that fruit character mm -hmm. Um, you have to keep an eye on acidity levels as well and make sure that that's not dropping too much because of um, of, of the dilution um so i mean that that that's, that's my dark side is is the uh, bad water um, um to to create a product to fit in with duty regime um but you know i i, I do you know, i manage to sleep at night still so i think we're okay <laughs> Um, we do have the ability, or I have the ability, if anyone wants to join us on screen, if anyone else is, is doing co-ferments um, and would like to just have, come and have a chat and, and perhaps talk about theirs, do feel free to do so. You should have a, 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 an option there to, 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 to join us, uh, and I can let you in uh, and do far off any other questions you might have. Um, so, Martin, um, selling selling co-ferments we've touched on already uh and the, and the challenges with the higher prices what um uh give me all your tactics i suppose now what, what, the, <laughs> what, um, what are the conversations that you're you're having uh when you're presenting these to to buyers um well i guess i've been encouraged by well the places where it's selling well are in uh, are alongside natural wine so um 
yeah, and 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 that those um, Scandinavian pet nats. So where, in those in those shops, bottle shops, predominantly where I, I guess those are where people are going to um, look for interesting products. Um, you know, so that where, where, where there are specialist uh, retailers there who who know their products and like to recommend them. So you've got a shop full of imported products, effectively. So we, we have that opportunity of of being being the local guy. Um, so it's all made cool by this fabulous range of imported stuff, which the guy in the shop can talk about. But but um, you know we we have that opportunity in 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 cider and and um, what can we call it straight cider. So cider made apples has that great opportunity as well. So dry bottle conditioned cider, um, British cider sits super well in that in 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 that shop. But I think it needs to be well presented. So in in this kind of out there design helps a little bit and and yeah. with a with, with a backstory so unfortunately um just well made product um uh, you know from with local fruit isn't enough in in that marketplace it needs to have a bit more of a story a bit more of something else um going on so and and, and what's been really good in the last few years is is there seems to be a movement um uh, in in British cider, and, and and that then has has got the 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 trade talking about it, and, and more prepared to try. I think if you're just trying to flog your own products, it's not it's not it's not enough for them to be interested. But if you can say this this is part of a part of a thing, all the all the cool cider makers are doing this. So um, so so therefore, as a retailer, you you need to clear away some of that other stuff you've got and and make an make an area for this. So it's more about promoting the category. Rather than promoting your individual product, so it, it's uh, it's that education again, isn't it? Um, people won't know about you, won't know about these products until they're there in, in front of them. Uh, so it's talking to those gatekeepers to make sure they know they understand what they are, um, and that they do find space on a shelf. Um, uh, and I guess the more the more people that do the co-ferments and the, the cider hybrids, um, and we can follow in with the natural wine movement and uh, on the other side the the craft beer sector you showed the picture of uh, that exciting beer so um, I think there are opportunities to to get people introduced to, to these to these drinks and mm -hmm. uh, the hyper category expands I think it's really good fun um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know it, you don't have to be a complete purist about, about cider um, uh, it, it's uh, and as Andrew Lee said yesterday I think it was Andrew wasn't it who said a uh, uh, that these um, these fruit ferments. No, it wasn't. Sorry, it was Pete Brown in the in the, in the session about uh, uh, John Evelyn uh, mentioning them all those years ago in the in that uh, treatise of of cider. So um, you know, they there there is a tradition there too. Um, we've got a couple more questions uh, come in. Lucy uh, has asked, are there any of your products that you re recommend drinking chilled or at room temperature because of the of the flavour change, Martin? Wow, I tend to leave those sort of questions to the sommeliers, really. To um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe maybe slightly warmer than super chilled these because they have got that, that those those fruity fruity flavors, lots of fantastic aromas, which are maybe um, promoted better by by not being frozen frozen cold. So yeah, a little warmer. I, I would go to my my go to phrase, which is cellar temperature, and uh, that's, that is that isn't overly cold. So if it's been in the fridge, then take it out an hour before, um, because otherwise you are just dulling the flavours that you've hopefully you know you've worked hard to to um, to introduce into those ciders. So not too warm, not too cold. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris asks, do you have any thoughts on uh, on beer cider hybrids or co-ferments? It's again, it's not a it's no not where I've ventured uh, other than tasting. I've tasted a couple, and and they've been fantastic, really interesting. What about you, Martin? Um, yeah, I've tasted a couple of good ones. Um, yeah, we we took some um, uh, apple apple juice to to uh, to yonder brewery brewery recently, who who made a very nice um, co ferment with with that with their, their sour sour beer. But yeah, it was, and so you, you could still actually taste the tannin um, from the Tremlitz bitter which which was the apple used there so that 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 was very good i mean um i guess we're slightly out of our depths in it well, i feel like slightly out of my depth not understanding the 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 full brewing side of 
side of that. Um, so it tends to be, you know, we take products to them and they 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 do their 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 stuff with it. Um, but yeah, I think this we we've got again have some apple uh, some cider in a yonder barrel in return. So with their their sort of sour culture lees on it, which has made a very nice dry cider. Um, so it hasn't got a huge huge beer character. Um, but yeah, and we need to do something with something with that. Um, I think anything that that helps to to broaden cider's appeal. So if we if we uh, manage to hook in a few uh, craft beer uh, aficionados on on uh, through these products, then it's it's a great thing for uh, for cider generally for the for the whole sector. And uh, someone else has asked a question about about um, for many to dry, which I should have really said in my in my little talk. So when we first started off, we were um, trying to sterile filter. Um, the blended cider before bottling, um, but that gave serious problems with it with 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 filtrating because of the the pectins in in the juice. That's not really a good way to go. So what we've been doing more recently is um, pasteurizing, so um, carbonating in a, in a tank, so in a bright tank, which is um, um, a method I've seen quite a lot in the in the states. So a big stainless steel tank that is pressurized, chilled. And then bubble CO2 up through it for for a day or so, um, and then bottle it from there, and then in bottle um, bath pasteurize those those bottles, which then captures the the all the fruit aromas and and makes it stable, but also means we can use um, lots of keeved sweetness without having to worry about refermentation in the bottle. It's, it's one of the um, challenges we found when we're using different fruits with with our ciders is the um, is the unknowns uh, the and filtration is one of the bigger issues um, and the other one um, that I I should have thought about but I didn't at the time but is protein stability um, with some of these fruits uh, they they have you know, apples don't don't have a lot of protein in them grapes do other fruits do. So you may find that you end up with a with a product which is actually unstable um, in terms of protein should it warm up, uh, and you may not know that until you hit the pasteurizer, uh, and the product suddenly goes cloudy, and you're hoping for a for a nice clean, clear product. So um, you know it's, it's it's doing the testing and 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 think about all all those additional things beyond our normal uh, uh, cider production techniques. Or, or but again that. That's maybe is part of the excitement and and part of the roller coaster ride. Our, our second smoky plum um, when we pasteurized it and it hadn't done a great job with um, racking off. Perhaps so there was still quite a lot of solid um, material, which then of course um, made a nice jam lump, um, which floating around in the in, in in the product. But if you're if you're then selling in that natural wine market and it's got bits in it, then it it, it actually looks even even better. Um, even more exciting than than if it was the first version, which was crystal clear and maybe a little bit too sterile uh, for that for that market. Anyway, brilliant. Uh, I think we're we're at the end of our session here, Martin. Um, so um, I, I think uh, hopefully we've we've answered all the questions that that were were asked um, during the session. Um, I've been keeping an eye on that, not on the chat. Um, thank you, Martin, for joining Great. us. Thank you. It's and, been fun. Uh, I love your love your pom pom, and um, hope to taste a load, load more from you very soon. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks, Simon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.